Great, hello everybody, and welcome back to the Zoom AI lecture series. So today we're delighted to have Pascal Paul with us, who is a professor at EPFL and whose work in computer vision and machine learning has established really a, a longstanding impact in monocular reconstruction, key point detection and, and matching, video tracking and service modeling. So today he's going to speak with us about deep 3D service meshes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, as Angie just said, uh, we've been modeling things from uh, video for quite a long time. And here's an example of something we did uh, a few years ago, which was you take a baseball, you shoot it out of a cannon at great speed and you watch the collision against something that looks like a bat. And uh, you might wonder why we would do such a thing, not because we are that interested in baseball, but because we were collaborating with people from Washington State University who are interested in the mechanical engineers who are interested in the physics of baseball. And so what we did was to use standard techniques to uh, take the video. In each image, we take a model of the undeformed ball and we deform it so that it projects at the right place. From this, we can infer a 3D shape. We do this for all the video, for all the images, and we get a 3D reconstruction of the ball. And the point of this is that is reasonably close to what really happens. So reconstruction, and this is a tool that our colleagues at, uh, at Wazoo could use to actually refine their simulation. They are mechanical engineers. They do simulations, but it's actually hard to model very well what's happening for real. And as surprising as it may sound, the computer vision was used to provide the ground truth. And their job was to tune the their simulators so that we produce something that looks like what we believe happened. So this is an example, one example of reconstru reconstructing 3D surfaces from video. And we've actually done a fair bit of this in mostly in the context of sports. So this is another example. This is a, a boat that uh, a sailboat on right there on this image there is a crew. But the real point of this was to go around the world alone. So only one person on the boat go around the world under sail power. And that takes something like 70 to 80 days. No one can be alert for 70 to 80 days all the time. And the idea was to put some computer vision on the boat so that uh, there would be, for example, a camera looking at the sail watching it deform and um, alerting the sailor to when they needed to be trimmed. And actually we didn't quite do that, but another idea of, would be to have a self trimming boat. You can observe your, your sail and then have some robotics aboard to actually trim the sail. That's I think within the realm of the feasible these days. Okay, so that was a lot of fun. And what all these examples had in common was that the way we were representing the surfaces, we were using explicit surface meshes, triangulated meshes to represent the, uh, the shapes and model the deformations. So this is good. I mean, this is a very broad, widely used tool in, uh, in graphics, in vision, and in many other fields, but it has one limitation, which is it's very hard to have the topology change while you're computing something. So if you start with a pure topology, you keep that topology. And this is why there's long been interest in implicit surfaces. And that actually predates deep implicit surfaces by quite a bit, at least, at least two or three decades. 
And the idea was that you could represent a surface by creating a volume of, for example, sine distances and treating the surface as the place where the distance goes to zero, as a zero crossings in that volume. And in the 80s, when this was actually looked at, it was found to be interesting, but also relatively impractical because to do what I just described, you needed to represent the volume at a very high resolution would, would take a lot of memory. And especially with a computer of 30 or 40 years ago, you didn't have it. So <coughs> that ID came and went and came back. <coughs> Sorry. It came back a couple of years ago in the form of deep SDF, when people realized that you didn't actually have to represent the volume as an array. You could use a deep net instead to do that. And that made this whole approach practical. And from 2019 on, and including at TUM, there's been a slew of papers on this topic because it is a very powerful way to do things. So for those of you who maybe are not completely familiar with SDF, let me uh, explain this a little, in a little bit more detail. So the idea is, so on this slide, I'm showing a surface, but it would be the same thing for a volume. So this representation is based on a function f, which is a function from R cube to R. And typically F is a sine distance to the surface. And the, the beauty of this is by changing F, you can change F continuously and have the topology of the surface change, which is something that's much, much harder to do if you use explicit representations. And this is very appealing, but as I just said, uh, the first implementations of this ran into the problem that it required way too much memory. And the way this was solved was by introducing these, uh, these deep SDFs. And the idea here is instead of storing the sign distance function in a pre-computed array, you would use a deep net, which is shown here. I hope you see my, I'm assuming you're seeing my mouse. If you don't, let me know. Um, the, that takes as input a point in space, X, Y, Z, and returns F theta of this X, where theta are the weights of the network. And this is supposed to be the sign distance. And this was later refined by introducing, by making this presentation conditional, where you now have not only as input to the network, not only a point in 3D space, but also a latent code, C, which are all given as input to the network. And the result is conditional on the value of C. What that does for you is that allows you to change the shape by changing C. In effect, C is a parameterization of the surface. So this is very nice, very effective, and has been extensively used, but it still has one problem, which is if you happen to need an explicit presentation, which many algorithms do, you need to run something like marching cubes. And marching cubes is inherently non-differentiable. So that's a bit of a problem because you have something non-differentiable in the middle of a deep network that breaks things. So this is one of the problems we've looked at, we have looked at how to make this fully differentiable all the way to the explicit surface. So let's me formalize this a bit. 
So when you do, uh, when you train your deep network, you have a loss function, L, which is going to be a function of the vertices and the facets of the explicit representation you're working with of the triangulations. So how do you do your forward pass? Well, you have the function S, you run marching cube MC, that gives you vertices and facets. And once you have that, you compute your loss function. So that's okay, no problem. Where the problem begins is when you want to do the backward pass. So if you want to do the backward pass, you want to differentiate your loss with respect to your parameters, the code C. So you do your usual chain rule. And so you end up for all the vertices, you have DL, DVI, vertex, DVI, DS, position of the vertex with respect to the, the sign function and the derivative of the sign function with respect to the code. So this term here, fine, it's differentiable. This one is two because it's an output of a network where you are, you have a problem is with this one. What is the derivative of the position of the vertices with respect to the sine distance function? And it cannot be trivially computed because marching cube is not differentiable. So that's a bit of a problem. But as it turns out, this is a problem that can be solved. Why? Well, let's recall that F theta approximates a sine distance function. And what do we know about sine distance function? That their gradient is one and that it actually is the normal to the surface. So if you do a bit of geometry, what you will realize is that if you have a surface, which I'm showing here, which is the zero crossing of your sine distance function, at every point on that surface, you have a normal that is the gradient of S. And if you change S infinitesimally, what's going to happen is the closest point to your, your vertex V on the deformed surface is going to move along that normal. So you can actually prove that DVDS, the thing we had trouble with, is actually minus a normal, which is also minus the gradient of the sine distance function. In other words, even though marching cubes is not differentiable, you can estimate this derivative. And in fact, this result can be extended to things that are not sine distance functions. And what you can prove is that dvds is minus the gradient of s over the square of the norm of s. And these two definitions are actually uh, consistent because when S is a sine distance function, the denominator here is one. So in short, what I have said is that with this theorem, you can, you have an analytical expression of this derivative in the blue oval, which means you can actually differentiate L with respect to C. So you have, you can produce an explicit mesh, marching cube included, and have the whole thing remain differentiable. So what that allows you to do is, for example, you start from an initial shape, which is a sphere, C0. It has a code that defines the sphere, and you are probably progressively going to attract it to 3D points, for example, that are on a torus. And your mesh will smoothly deform from C by changing the code. And the algorithm goes as follows. You start with a deep SDF code. Uh, you use marching cube to compute the mesh and vertices. You then use these mesh and vertices to do the forward pass 
and to compute the derivatives for backpropagation using the formulas I had on the previous slide. You update the SDF code and you iterate. So we can turn a sphere into a torus, so something that's genus zero into something that's genus one, or a little cow into a duck. So again, we go from genus zero to genus one. At every step, we have a mesh and it's all differential. Okay, so this is essentially the, the technical heart of this talk. So I'm now going, what I'm now going to do is to show you applications of this. So if you have any questions about the theory part, now would be a perfect time to ask them. Clearly, it was wonderfully clear, and uh, I, think, I think it's it's too last I think you can just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Harder in the online setting. Okay, I'll I'll keep going, but uh, don't forget if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. It makes it more lively. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, show how it works in the framework of single view reconstruction. So what we can do is let's say we have images of cars. I mean, we use ShapeNet among others. And we can train a ResNet to actually we use, uh, we learn to uh, this coding scheme that allows us to generate uh, the, these, these car images. And once we have that, we can plug into this. So the ResNet here produces 3D volumes. We connect to it. Uh, we use Marchicube to make it a mesh and then a differentiable renderer to actually turn this mesh into a, an outline. And now the game is going to make that outline to be as similar as possible to the images we have. So here's an example where we have a chair. So we just have the image. Uh, we can compute an initial code that gives, well, a rough estimate of what that chair is. And then we can use our differentiable scheme to refine that code until we get a 3D volume that projects at the right place. So we start from this. So in the earlier slide here, we had a sphere and here we had a toroid. Here in this example, we have a rough chair that's being optimized to become a, a much improved chair and here I'm looking at it from the viewpoint I used for the reconstruction, but to show that I have a reasonable uh, 3D reconstruction, I'm also showing it from a different viewpoint to try to convince you that it truly is a good 3D reconstruction. And at the time it was, we had the usual uh, numbers to show that we got results that were state of the art. And here is a little video that shows this in action. So we start from a sketch and given the sketch, it produces a 3D volume. And then we can play with that. We can actually give new outlines manually and the system will deform the 3D volume so it conforms to the new sketch. So in this example, we sketched a chair and now we're going to play with that chair. So we're going to extend it to make it longer. Or we are going to now play with the arms of the chair. By giving new outlines, we can make the arms go higher. Or we can make them lower. And what's going to be interesting in a moment is initially 
when we lower the arms, not much happens. The, uh, the arms just get a bit lower, but now something interesting, I think going to be happen, which is we lower the arm so much that there is no space anymore for, for the no hole anymore. And what's just happened is we had a smooth transition again with an object with holes to an object without holes. And that's something that this combination of implicit and explicit surfaces allows you to do. Okay, so this was fun. And actually, I mean, I think this is topical since we are going to get the reviews for CVPR uh, tomorrow. This is the kind of things you need to do to have a chance to be accepted. But this is a toy application because if you want to reconstruct the 3D shape of chairs, there are better ways than doing this kind of single view reconstruction. So what I would like to show you now is a real application of this kind of techniques. And the application is going to be shape optimization. So let's think about what happens when you try, you're an engineer in say a car company and you want to design a car, a race car. So typically you are going to build a shape, a shape, a 3D shape on your using whatever software, CAD software you, you like. Then you're going to simulate its performance. You're going to build it right away. You're going to first simulate it, see how it does. And probably the first time it won't quite do what you want. So you will have to redesign and re-simulate. And this is typically the way it's done. It works, but it's very slow and very expensive because it takes quite a while to design. Then once you've done your design, you send it to uh, the people who do the simulations. You wait a day or two, they give you back your simulation. And so every redesign iteration takes days. So there's been an intense push in the CAD community to make this faster. So there is actually a, a technique that's fairly popular to do this called Kriging. Uh, you can also call it Ga Gaussian processes, it's the same. And it goes as follows. You create a number of shapes, actually to be, to form a training database. And for each one of these shapes, you run your favorite C CFD simulation tool. And that will return the, the physical properties you're interested in. So for the car, it could be the drag or the downforce. For a plane, it would be lift. It could be anything really. And then what you do is you create what's known as a response surface. So what is that? Well, in this little graph on the right, every little red cube is one example for which we've run a simulation. And it has a performance number, for example, the drag. So once you have this, what you can do is nonlinear interpolation to compute the response surface to try to guess what the value of the drag will be at places for which you don't have a simulation. And this is useful because once you have the surface, you can look for a potential optimum without running any new simulations. So it is much faster and it is automatable. So this is a very good technique, very useful. However, it suffers from one limitation, which is that uh, Gaussian processes do not like to work in very high dimensional spaces. So once your model has more than a few tens of parameters, it kind of chokes, it doesn't work as well. So what can you do? Well, we are talking about nonlinear interpolation in high dimensional spaces. So of course, what are we going to do? Deep networks, because that's exactly what they do. Uh, one way to think about them is they are interpolators in high dimensions. So what we did was to replace the, the Gaussian processes by 
CNNs, and more specifically, GCNNs, where the G stands for geodesic. Why? Because we are not operating on images, we are operating on 3D meshes. That represent the objects we're interested in. And what that changes is the fact that now we can have as many parameters in our models as we want. The, G, the, the, the GCNN will accept it and do reasonable things. So here is a schematic of the kind of GCNN we use. I mean, it's nothing particularly fancy. It's actually a bunch of ResNet blocks that are trained to predict things like, for example, a number, which might be the drag, for example, or pressure values at every vertex of the mesh, which you can use to do various computations. And it actually works quite well. So for example, here's an, we have a collaboration with Airbus. And on this slide, what you see is half an Airbus. And you can run a full simulation. It'll take you about an hour in this case. And the colors you see represent uh, pressure values on the air, aircraft. Or we can run our GCNN, which will produce essentially the same results, but in 30 milliseconds instead of a one hour. What this graph at the bottom shows is you have the profile of the wing and you have the pressure profile computed either by the simulator or by our GCNN. And as you can see, they are very close. And I didn't cherry pick. It's actually, they are, I could show many, many other examples like this. So this actually also allows you to compute, say, the drag of a car. So here are various cars with pressure fields and that result in uh, different drag values. These predicted values are very close to the real ones. And in, very importantly, they, since they are estimated using a deep net, they are differentiable as well. They are differentiable functions of the 3D position of the vertices. And we can exploit this to automate. So here is an example in which we have an incompressible an incompressible sphere. We put a shell around that sphere and it is, its shape is being optimized to reduce drag. So the wind is coming from the right and it produces this funny shape with a long tail, which actually, if you run the real simulation, you'll see that it actually, it has a pretty good drag coefficient. And for those of you who are interested in cycling, if you've ever watched uh, the helmets of bike racers who do uh, who go on tracks, they have these long pointy helmets because essentially it solves a very similar problem, which is enclosing a round thing, the, the head of the cyclist, while trying to reduce drag. Um, then you can also do things on, say, drones. So this is a called this is a SenseFly drone called the EB, and it's a, it's a commercial thing. You can buy it, and it flies very well. But if you look at it closely, you will see that the form of the wings is fairly primitive. I mean, they didn't invest that much effort in making the the wings very very efficient. So. Uh, the, the penalty for that is that you can make it fly, but you use more electricity to, uh, to keep it in the air, which reduces the range. So it is useful to try to improve the, what's called a lift over drag. So that's a standard measure for aircrafts, this ratio of lift over drag that denotes how well, how good the aerodynamics are. So this is the drone as you can buy it. This is uh, what happens if we just optimize the shape of the wings. 
We improve the L over D and we can actually further improve it if we deform not only the wings, but also the body. We turn this drone into what's called a flying body, which in which uh, the fuselage also contributes to the lift. And of course, this is done under constraints. So it's an optimization under constraints because we must keep enough space inside the fuselage to, uh, to put the, the payload and the engine. So this was done in simulation, but now this is real. Uh, so what you're looking at is a bicycle. So this was built by colleagues in NC in, uh, in France. And uh, what this is the bike once it's finished. So uh, it's the same thing, it's painted. You can see the wheels at the bottom. You can see the two bikers. And when they ride, they actually in a reclining position. So their head is here, their bottom is here, and their feet are here, and the pedals are here. And the game here is to uh, go as fast as you can. So there, there was this competition in, uh, in Nevada where there is a very long straight road. That road is eight kilometers long. It's straight and flat. So they did pedal as hard as they could and they were clocked on the last 100 meters. And on that last 100 meters, they were going at these speeds, which is it's pretty fat. It's not electric, right? It's purely muscle power. Uh, and that was good enough for a couple of world records. So, I mean, there are lots of things that you have to do to beat world records, but having good aerodynamics was definitely one of them. So in the example I've shown, we did the optimization with respect to all the vertices of the mesh. But you can also, you might, and many applications, you might want to introduce priors. And essentially, I'm back to my deep SDFs where I want to train a network to produce, say, cars. So I'm going to use shape nets to learn a deep SDF representation where all the cars within that family are parametrized in terms of a code, typically a vector of length about 256. And I am going, to, I can do my optimization with respect to that code. So what I do to do that, once I've trained my shape network, my deep SDF, I plug into it the GCNN that computes uh, the drag or the downforce or whatever. And I have a fully differentiable pipeline that goes from C, the parameterization, to D of C, which is the drag, and I can optimize with respect to C. So for example, here I take uh, some SUV and I change C so as to minimize drag. Or in this example, what we have, we turn this into a tool for designers. We are back to giving a, an iPad to a designer, a graphic designer, allowing, we allow them to sketch. And from that sketch, the system will produce a 2D shape that looks as much as possible as what they drew while having good uh, aerodynamic performance. Okay, moving on. One limitation to what I've shown so far is the car I showed you or the plane or the whatever, where one single surface. So this is not an ideal representation of an object you want to build and you expect to perform a function and cars have wheels, the wheels are separate for the body, they are not supposed to touch it. And 
you need, in fact, if you want to go towards real world applications, you need a representation that's a bit more sophisticated than what I've shown so far. And this is what we are currently working on, is representing the objects in terms of a set of primitives, not a single SDF that can be optimized and change result like the ones you see on the right and the difference between what you see on the right and what I showed before is that now the wheels, for example, are separate objects and we can ensure that they don't touch the body of the car so that the thing will roll when we build it. So the, the idea here is that the individual parts will adapt to each other and the kind of network we now use to do this is an extension of the deep SDF I showed before, where we still have a latent vector, but that is being decoded both in terms of a generic surface, typically the card body, and various primitives that go with it. So in the car, it might be the car body and the wheels. In this example at the top, it's what you're seeing here is what's called a water mixer. So what is a water mixer? It's something at, at one end you send liquid, I mean liquids, I should say, that are separate. It goes inside this tube where there's this helix and the helix turns and that actually mixes the fluid and hopefully when it exits, it's homogeneous and well mixed. So what we can do with the representation we I've shown you here is in this case, we have the helix that is represented as a deep SDF. We put it in this tube and we can change the dimension of the tube. And the helix will adjust naturally so that it touches exactly the side of the tube. Or we can play at uh, changing uh, the topology of the, not maybe the topology, but the shape of the helix while still ensuring that um, geometric constraints are observed typically that the helix just touches, just fits into the inside of the tube. Or in this example, what we can do, is we take a car and we can change its wheels. So we make, we take bigger wheels, we change the distance, we change the wheelbase, the distance between the wheels and the body of the car will adjust. So this is actually a fairly powerful tool which are now working at integrating into real CAD systems. And since after all, I am still a vision guy, I also want to use this in connection with images. Mm -hmm. So another application we are working on is modeling the heart from biomedical imagery. And in this case, the, what the primitives are going to be, they're going to be the four, the four chambers of the heart. So you want to get those and the constraints are this in a functional heart, the four chambers have to connect to each other. It's no use have to have very nice reconstructions if you don't have the right connections because the blood won't go through. So it is important, these notions of making the parts consistent to each other is really important. And the final thing that we are currently working on, this is a collaboration with uh, Microsoft Research, is to design a plane, a glider in this case, that will be able to do what's called dynamic soaring. So what is dynamic soaring is, I'm representing it um, here on this slide, which is you find a place where you have wind, you have two different winds. You have a lot of wind high up and no wind further down. And there are places where this happens. And it turns out that if you do the right kind of maneuvers, you can steal energy from the wind and make your glider accelerate. So right now there are people who do this, like this guy here that you see, they use remote control and they get their gliders. So again, no engine 
to go up to 800 kilometers an hour. That's really fast. Uh, and one of the problems is at these speeds, it becomes really hard to control. I mean, human reflexes are not fast enough. So what we want to do is to make a robotic glider that will do this. And what we are going to use this approach I've described is to design not only for performance, but for controllability. So build in the ability to control the glider right from the start. And the tools I, uh, I have told you about tonight, it turns out that mathematically, it's not that complicated. We have all what we need. Of course, this is in theory, and I'm absolutely sure that, I'll, uh, well, it will be complicated, but because the real world is difficult, but at least this approach gives us a handle on these kinds of problems. And maybe I'll be able to talk about how, what we did in a future talk. Anyway, in conclusion, what I've shown is that uh, we have a way to combine explicit and implicit representations in a way that takes advantage of their relative strength. This is based on deep sign functions, and that allows us to model 3D, explicit 3D meshes that can change the topology while preserving end-to-end -end differentiability. And I think this opens to, to a slew of new applications in fields as diverse as CAD, which I've talked about quite a bit, and medical imaging, and probably many others. And of course, uh, what I presented was the work of many people, and you can see their names here. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And now if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, super, super cool, actually. Um, actually, one of the few talks I've seen where like all this research is actually applied to real world applications. So very exciting. Um, I, I, I want to start with one question. I'm actually like really curious. So how far are you in terms of doing like fully differentiable simulations and then back propagating to the rest of the like SDF based representations? Is that already what you're doing there? That's or? already work. I mean, that's already work. Okay. It's, it's already, I mean, actually uh, there is a spin-off associated to, to all this, which is called Neural Concept and they have real clients. So it, it really works. Cool. I mean, this is super exciting. How fast are the simulations there, actually? Like the, I mean, because you have to simulate basically every backdrop step, right? No. no. So the simulation is, we, we, I mean, I know not, I mean, I, I know very little about simulation. I'm a user of simulation. Okay. So the simulation are normal. They're just, they're slow. Uh, what we do is we leverage simulation. So typically, where you would have in a normal thing, maybe you would need 10,000 simulations. We only need 100 to train the network. And then the, the network computes the, the simulated values in between. The, you see that maybe I wasn't clear. Say you have two cars. You simulate for these two cars. And then what the network will do, it will guess the results for a car, any car intermediate between these two, you will not have to re-simulate. You will use the GCNN to compute its performance. I see. So you have an estimator that tells you how well the performance works. Right. So uh, this, is, this was this, uh, uh, this idea, which is, I say, two cars, but it's more than two. But these the, the, the little dots here are things for which you run the simulation normally. I, I, I see, but I guess what I was thinking of, how far could it be when you say, oh, for every backdrop step of updating the surface, of every fitting step of the surface, you could rerun a simulation. In a no, th th then we don't, that, that we don't need to do that. I see, so you're making it faster by having an intermediate like estimator that tells you, hey, look how good or bad is it for right. that representation. And that's gonna be, computationally tractable 
rather than what I said is where you had to like re-simulate basically every backdrop step. Now, now the real life is always messy. So the real in real uh, in the real world, what you will do is uh, when the shape gets away from the training samples. Uh, the predictions of the GCNN becomes less reliable, and you might want to re-simulate. I see. Well, and that that and that gets. I mean, I don't have the. Uh, this is still an open problem. For one thing, you need to compute uncertainty. So you need to say, ah, my predictions—they're not so good anymore. I need a few more simulations. And. Um, and then how many? So it turns into an active learning problem. Okay, but that is mainly because this is the computational feasibility then, right? Like how many times do you want to update versus how many, or like how certain are you and stuff like this, right? right? Yeah. Okay, no, very cool actually, super cool. Any, any other questions? I don't want to go into too much, but I, I got very excited. I mean, I, yeah, Dan? Yeah. Um, uh, hi, uh, hi, Pascal. Hi. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Andre, to interrupt. <laughs> um, so uh, first, uh, thanks uh, for the talk. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, and uh, I had a question about uh, optimizing uh, the shape of meshes uh, with a photometric loss. So let, let's say I have a triangle mesh, and I'm trying to optimize uh, the shape of this mesh based on uh, RGB images. Uh, right. Would you recommend uh, uh, using some uh, implicit uh, representation on top of that uh, uh, to actually optimize the shape instead of? Having well, I mean, the people are people have been doing doing that a lot, so it works. But it works, I think, up to a point. So, uh, for example, we have in uh, TPFL we have uh, Wenzel Jack Wenzel Jacob, who's a good uh, graphics guy, and he has this Mitsuba thing. And he likes to do super realistic stuff. And for that, you need the explicit mesh. So all the implicit representations that I know of make a bunch of simplifications. So if you can live with these simplifications, fine, no need for a mesh. But if you need more precision, then probably you will need the mesh eventually. Mm -hmm. so that answer the... Yep, thanks. Because Andre, you had a question, right? Yeah, I had a question. Hi, I'm Andre. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, my question was, so the objects that you were showing um, were like very much rigid, right? So you were still deforming them, but like the scar in itself, it doesn't deform too much. What if you try to apply this to like simulating clothing, you know, and some... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some properties of the clothing. Do you think the same approach might work? I, I hope I can give you a definite answer in two or three years because I have a couple of PhD students working on just that problem. And uh, so what we want to do, what we're working on, the general idea, is to try to model the body and the clothes separately because... <coughs> <coughs> A lot of the current approaches, if I see in literature, you, you, you can do close people, but typically you get a model for the person and the close together. What we'd like to do is to actually model the body, for example, using uh, simple, and model the close using the approach I have described, and try to reason a bit about the physics, the collisions and all that and see whether we can go a bit further than what's currently done using that approach. So yes, I think it can be done and we're trying to do it. Yes, I see it. Very interesting. And I think we're thinking into the same direction, but yeah. Um, so do, if you have, do you maybe have like some, some tips there if you have already explored <laughs> this? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, and not Really, we well, okay. So the the, the PhD students I'm talking about started uh, uh, a few months ago, so we're still early in the process. My it's not a tip, but my perception of what's happening is that 
in a sense, we, what we see, if you think of somebody wearing um, flowing clothing, so not tight clothing, what we see is what the clothes are doing. And that gives us constraints on where the body should be. And that's the way I think we're going to try to formulate it. And what this formalism I've presented gives us, allows us to do is every, everything is going to be one of these deep meshes. And uh, we can actually, we have all the tools we need to reason about the physics of the interaction. So it's certainly not going to be easy, but we have, I think, the required tools to start looking at it. Okay, thank you. Helen, you had a question? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I'm curious about, um, I know that uh, you can drag some vertices to deform the mesh or the topology, um, but I uh, don't know how to uh, get, the, uh, for example, some air pressure, uh, like the slide 29 shows that. Uh, I see that you change the uh, mesh, or the shape of the model, but you can also calculate the, some air pressure. I, do you need also use some engine, uh, some physical engine to do that, or you can just uh, predict it from the ship? We, we, we only we predicted from the shape. So we train the network to predict it from the shape. Um, uh, so in, in this example I have on the slide, um, it's, that's what's called the, the technical term. We didn't invent that. This, uh, it's called a surrogate method where we really have a function, a differentiable function that is trained to do the interpolation. So which is what I'm trying to show the graph on the right shows. Uh, uh, is there some limitation for the shape deformation? I mean, for example, you can just use the network on the car, but not on the airplane. Uh, and well, you, you probably have to, tr we haven't completely, I don't have a definite answer to this, but typically you would train it on a class of objects. Oh, okay. Yes. We yes. don't have something that would work for anything. Okay, yes, thanks. Okay, Tata, I guess you were next. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the nice talk. So I have a question towards towards the end, you showed that uh, you're, you're modeling different surfaces uh, separately, for example, the car body and the car wheels. Right. So in that place, and also you mentioned that we can uh, change the wheel and then the car shape will, will optimize uh, accordingly to maintain the aerodynamics. Now my question is how how I mean if two surfaces are modeled differently or separately, then how how this thing can happen? Like how one okay. thing can influence the other? Okay, because uh, they are not modeled separately, right? This is what this I mean. This the graphs are ugly, but uh, that's what they're trying to convey, which is when we learn the little representation, we train it. Mm -hmm. so that it produces this different kind of primitives that in the end are all SDFs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I mean, essentially it learns the relationship between these things during training. And if that's not enough, you can add explicit constraints. So for example, you can add constraints about interpenetration, mm -hmm. that the wheels are not allowed to enter the body. Yeah, so, so you mean here at high level, so you, you learn the uh, joint representation of different surfaces. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, Alex, I guess you were next. Hi, thank you so much for the great Hi. talk. Um, I would like to go back to slide 14, uh, where you um, basically showed the first results of the method. And uh, I was just wondering how you enforced a 3D consistency. I mean, probably in training, then you have some kind of multi-view um, supervision, right? Because uh, as far as I understand, you just do silhouette rendering. Yeah, in, uh, we learned, we have a 3D model initially that's been trained on the 3D. Mm, okay. So it's long the prayers, and which is why in the video I showed on the following slide, you've noticed that I pull one... Uh, 
one foot of the chair and the right. other follows. Okay. And because that's essentially uh, embodied by the prior we use. All right. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Then again, yeah, thanks a lot for the amazing talk. I think um, Thank you very it was much. really cool. And um, we're going to be back with our lecture series next, uh, next week. But otherwise, um, thanks a lot, Pascal, again. And see you, everybody, next week then. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye.